hello everybody and welcome to this episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast where today I'm going to be reading your emails and your comments and find out what makes you tick and then I'll answer things or talk about stuff so that'll be fun am I right okay well to um get going right away here I just want you guys to know that five stars or the highest rating you can give the show wherever you listen to stuff is the best way to go about doing stuff so make sure that's a thing so we have a lot to get into today so let's get right into those shout outs and let the people know who fucking care for this fucking content to be available for everyone else who's a cheap ass bastard let's give them the thanks they're due so a big thank you to those motherfuckers over there on patreon michael cedar harry you guys are awesome thank you so much over at the youtube thank you crew where by the way you can be a part of the bukowski book club that's just something you might want to look into If you're interested, there's an announcement video on my YouTube channel. But a big thank you to Patrick, to Britt, to JH, to Jan, to Deb, to Ethan, to Julia E., who is our newest member of the crew. Thank you, Julia. I appreciate you. And then over there in the Anarchy crew, we got Bunny, Nate, Mindy, Thomas, Tim J., Shaylin, Tim G., Chill Baby, Tamara and Adam, thank you guys so much. You guys are fucking awesome. And then for the burgest, wonderful motherfuckers over there. In the Chapbook of the Month Club, we got our chappies. Caitlin and Chase, thank you guys so much. It's people like you who make doing something like this feel so damn good. All right. That was a bit creepy. I feel kind of bad about that. But with that said, on with the Slobolo. And we're back. Right back here where we belongs. So what I'm going to do now, um, there are quite a few comments that I wanted to make. And the first one is going to be this one right here. I want to give a little shout out to... (laughs) I want to give a shout out to fucking Wicked Hole, who said on um, the last episode, hot shit, all the books on your Etsy are just five bucks each. Thanks for the plug, bruh. Yeah, so that is what the big 555 thing is. Um, Cinco dollars on Cinco de Mayo. 20 of my chat books are um, five dollars each. As of this recording, and it probably will only last through today, maybe the weekend. It's Friday today as I'm recording this. So by the time you hear this, um, there probably will not be a sale anymore, and you'll have to pay full price. But that's what you fucking get for not taking heed when I fucking give you information. On that episode of um, Falling Out of Love with Poetry... Um, I got this really nice comment from Jessica, uh, the soft-spoken poet whose channel is now The Soft Spoken Life. Jessica says, I have a codependent situationship with my writing. That's clever as fuck. Um, You covered more here in three minutes than three years of therapy. Golden advice. Matt is a gem, y'all. That is so fucking sweet, and um, I just appreciate you so much. Thank you for that. I would like to hear more about a codependent situationship with writing. Like, I wish you could elaborate that more. Like, how does codependency with your writing work? Like, what's that like? I would love to hear about that. Chasey said, on writing matters, I feel disheartened because I have no audience. And when I do have an audience, same. With that said, like, nothing happens overnight. Like, you need to just keep fucking going and keep whittling and keep 
just stabbing and fucking just go, 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 go. And I know it fucking sucks, but the, the thing here is, especially with Chase, like, I, I know Chase's stuff. I know Chase's work. Chase's work is great. It's fucking moving. It's fucking gritty. It's fucking raw. It's awesome. But the thing about Chase that's really fucking amazing is that Chase is constantly making content, constantly writing, constantly creating. She sends me stuff all the time, and she has probably enough stuff to be putting books out every month. Easy. Easy, you know? And, like, when I first started putting out my poetry chapbooks, nobody fucking knew about them, and nobody fucking gave a shit. And it took, like, probably until... It's really hard because when I first started making um, the poetry chat books, I was tabling at a bunch of conventions and zine fests and shit like that. And so you end up selling a bunch of stuff just because you're tabling somewhere and you could like schmooze people and the whole deal. But it again, at that time, I was really pushing Weird Mask. Like, that was, like, my big thing. And the poetry chat books was, were just something I was doing on the side, kind of. And so, like, Weird Mask was the thing that I was selling a shit ton of copies of, and that's why I didn't make very many of, like, the first, like, six or seven poetry chapbooks I did. Because I just didn't think I was going to sell a lot of them. And it took a while. And you just have to keep going. But what I will say is if you don't have stuff for people to get, no one will know that it's out there to get. But when they do come across you and they see, like five or six books they'll be like oh this person's fucking serious this person's doing something i should fucking pay attention and then the biggest plus to that is is if they end up falling in love with your work they know that you're putting stuff out and committing to you as an artist is something that's fucking worth a damn because you will be consistently putting stuff out consistency is a huge thing like and if we like look at it from a TV show standpoint, if this isn't you, I'm sure you've heard somebody say this to you where they're like, yeah, I don't watch new shows until they're done. So I know that like I can watch them and not be like ripped off where like, cause all of you have known like those TV shows you're watching and then they don't get renewed and they're like halfway in an arc and you're like, what the fuck? Like, so it's just done. It's over. What am I supposed to fucking do now? Okay. Okay. It's not exactly the same, but a lot of people <clears throat> want to know that there's a ton of stuff out there for them to get if they like that fucking thing. So if they like you as a poet, they want to know that you have product that they could keep coming back to. You know what I'm saying? It's a lot easier for you to sell. This is fucking no shit, Sherlock, but... It's a lot easier for you to sell a lot of books when you have a lot of books. Okay? And, like, that might sound fucking stupid as shit. But, and I, and I make this statement a lot. Usually when people go to my shop and buy a book, they will go because, like, like right now, like, me as an action figure is the book that I'm pushing right now. Some people will go to pick that book up. But while they're in the store, they'll usually buy one or two more. Like most orders I ship are two to three books. Sometimes more, sometimes it's just one, but most orders I ship are two to three books. And most people probably aren't going, oh, I, I need to go to Matt's shop so I could get this book, this book, and this book. They usually go to get one book and then they end up with more. And usually the people who end up buying more books are the ones who keep coming back and getting more and more and more. So the only thing I could say, if you are as prolific as Chase, like there's a bunch of you out there who are this prolific, like Bunny, you're another one. You know, you guys write a ton of stuff and you guys can be putting stuff out all the fucking time. You don't need permission or if you need permission, I'm giving you permission right now. You have permission to put out as much stuff as you want. As often as you want. I only do once a month because that works for me. If you want to do shorter chapbooks every week, 
you can do that. If you want to do shorter chapbooks every three months, you can do that. If you want to do longer chapbooks every month, do that. You can do whatever you want to build your fan base. Your audience is there. They just don't know you're there. So let them know you're fucking there. You know what I'm saying? You guys got this. Oh, and then there's like Chill Baby, who might not write as much as everybody else, but the stuff Chill Baby writes is long. Like, Chill Baby could probably put out, like, one chapbook a month, and it would just be one poem. It's like fucking, like, an epic poem from Dante or Homer or something like that, you know? And it's good fucking shit. Like, we're all different. We all do different shit. And it's you just have to know that it's okay to go out and do that so um i hope that was helpful that was kind of a sorry guys that was like a lot okay so this is um about my uh uncurated versus unpublished thing okay wicked hole check this out this was so fucking funny it at twelve twenty seven in the episode I, I can't even remember what latin word i was pronouncing but i think it was supposed to be public and it's based off of the word whatever. And when I read it in my accent, I said, pubic hair. Okay? When I was doing the episode, I didn't realize I did that. And then when I was editing the episode, I'm like, oh my god, did I just say pubic hair? What the fuck was that? And I'm like, oh, well, no one will fucking notice. And then, like, fucking the day it goes up, I get a comment, 1227, pubic hair. That's fucking hysterical. So, good job on catching that one. In that episode, I asked you guys, like, are you afraid to, like, post your poems on your social media for fear that you won't be able to get that stuff published? And I said, like, let me know what you think about that stuff, and we'll talk about it. And um, Wicked Hole says, seriously, though, I post poems on my socials if they're sufficiently short or just meant to be funny. If it's a poem I've tried harder on, I tend to be a little more precious about it, and I'll try getting it into publications for a bit first, or hang on to it for some half-serious plan to self-publish it in a book of my own someday. I know ultimately it doesn't matter, though. Hardly anyone wants to read poetry anyway. Might as well drop your poems wherever you can. Still, it feels nice to be accepted in someone else's publication. Validation gives me a stiffy. Well, I'm glad that I can um, help you out there and um, make you stiff. There's things we need to talk about here. So first off, the poems that you don't take serious are the poems that you show everyone. And then the poems that you do take serious, you hang on to. This is like kind of a double-edged sword because it's cool that you're showing people stuff. But what you're also doing, and this might not be exactly you, but there might be other people who can understand this and learn from it or whatever. But if you are showing people a side of you, a side of your work that isn't representative of who you are and what your work is, when you eventually do put something out, the audience that you have cultivated is going to be disappointed with the thing that they finally get because they're coming to you for this like short funny poems and then if you give them something big and serious they're going to be like what the fuck is this i've been following this dude for fucking whatever and this is what i'm getting so it could be something that kind of hurts you more than helps you so if for instance if you're posting these short little funny poems under a different name and then when you go ahead and post the poems that you are taking more serious, it's under a different name, then that won't be a problem. But the problem is, this whole time that you're doing this and just posting these little silly poems, you're building an audience. So then when you finally put out a book, that audience won't even fucking know about it. So what's the point? Unless the point is just like having your poems out there. So you said, I posted a poem today. So that, that, that's, a, that's fine too. But it's funny because I was just talking to somebody um, the other day about I'm putting together the Bloodshed Review and inside the Bloodshed Review, each issue is going to have a chapbook in it of a featured poet. One of the featured poets over the next couple issues here wanted to do this kind of joke 
chapbook. And it's not like a joke, but it's like a stab. It's like um, kind of like a satire kind of thing. And that's what they wanted to put out. And I said, like, if that's what you want to do, then I I support you 100% if that's what you want to do. But, like, I think you're amazing. And I want people to see the stuff that you do that is amazing. And I want this to be a showcase for you. So I would rather you put something out that really, like, accentuates your talent and your voice, you know. But if you really want to do this thing that's kind of like a satirical stab, you know, then by all means we can do that. But it's this whole idea, like, especially when you're building your audience, there needs to be a consistency so people can see, like, oh, shit, this is what this person's about. Like, if I wrote, I don't know, like, two chapbooks on drinking and fucking or whatever and then the next chat book I put out was like a book of love poems to the Garfield comic strip like that might fly but it might be like what the fuck is this like I don't understand what's happening right here okay uh, and I'm not saying that you can't like theme your books differently you can theme your books any way you want but when you change your voice when you change how you write to do something it it usually doesn't come off well once um everything's happening there so anyway thank you for the comment now this one is a lot bigger okay and um this is from chill baby it says i don't post stuff because i don't understand copyright rules if i want to put out a book are certain sites or like the poetic anarchy volumes for instance do they own the poem now, even though all they did was say, sure, okay. Do I have to credit everybody every time I put it out somewhere and use it or read it? Can people make trouble for me because I posted a poem on a site, for instance, and then used it later in a book or an anthology? I just don't get it, and I'm trying to avoid obstacles as lots of people enjoy being a-holes and shutting down other people's endeavors. There's a lot more here, and we might talk about it, too. A couple things right off the bat. As far as I have been aware of everything, like through working with all the different kinds of art that I've worked in, poetry seems to me, and I might be wrong about this, but for me, in my experiences, poetry has been the least strict on all this stuff. Like, you're never going to get in trouble for anything. Like, don't, like, nothing's going to happen. But the most important thing here is, is that like whenever your stuff goes somewhere, usually there will be a contract. And in that contract, it will usually say what's going on. But usually what it is, is that person is like borrowing your poem to put in this publication. The poem is always going to be yours unless you actually sign something that says you're signing the rights of this poem to this person in perpetuity. Like, that's always how that would work. It's usually a thing where they're just taking it for this publication. Now, the thing you said in here that was pretty interesting, you said, um, do I have to credit everybody every time I put it out somewhere? This is, like, something that happens, and, like, you should be crediting it for your own clout, Okay, so for instance, usually on the, it's usually in the back of the book, like in the acknowledgments or it's on the copyright page where it'll say where some of these poems have been published before. And then you list and you thank the people for publishing those poems. You know, it's like a thank you. So, oh, here's a good example. In... Um, the Days Run Away Like Wild Horses Over the Hills by Charles Bukowski, which we are reading in May this month for um, the Bukowski Book Club. On this, it says, Grateful acknowledgement to the editors of the following magazines where some of these poems first appeared. Ant, Avalanche, Caterpillar, Compass Review, Choice, Coastlines, Coffin, Dare, Dust, Earth, Epos, Evergreen Review, Evidence, Gallows, Grist, 
Harlequin, Hearst, Here in Poetry Review, um, Icon Latre, whatever, Intrepid, um, Clatter, um, Literary Art Press, Merlin's Magic, The New Lancer Club Review, Nomad, Northwest Review, Notes from Underground, Olay, Outcry, The Outsider, Oiz, Prism International, Quagga, Quicksilver, Coyote, Renaissance, Stasis, I can't even read that word, Samachoy, um, Semenia, Showcase, Something, Southern Poetry Review, Stony Brook, Targets, Vagabond, Wild Dog, and the Wormwood Review. And then it says, some of these poems were also collected in the following chapbooks. Flower Fist and Bestial Whale by E.W. Griffith, editor-publisher, Hearst Chapbooks. Poems and Drawings, Will Tulos and Evelyn Thorne, editors at Epos. Longshot Poems for bro- Broke Players, Carl Larson, editor-publisher, Seven Poets Press. Run with the Hunted, R.R. Cuskenden, editor and publisher, Midwest Poetry Chapbooks. Cold Dogs in the Courtyard, J. Nash, editor-publisher, Literary Times, a Bukowski sampler, Morris Edelson, publisher, Coyote Press. So that is a very good way and, um, I don't know, like a lovely way to show people that you appreciate what they've done for you and also show readers of your book that, holy shit, this person's got fucking clout. And hopefully the people you think in your acknowledgments have names that are easy to say and have magazines that's names aren't so like hard to say that I can't say it in a fucking goddamn podcast episode. I seriously feel like I'm going to have a stroke right now. I'm all dizzy. Whew, that was a lot of words that I couldn't say. Okay, so the other thing I'm going to say about this is that Amazon is a stickler if you are in KDP Select, okay? So if you put a book up on Amazon and it's not in KDP Select, your stuff could be everywhere. If you have a book up on Amazon and you have some poems that are in KDP Select, or like you have a chapbook of poems on KDP Select, and then you post those poems on Instagram or on your website or anything like that, Amazon could um, like give you a strike or take your book down or tell you, hey, get this poem off um, the internet or else we're going to take your book down. Now, I don't know if it's because poems are so short, but I have not had this problem with poetry. I have had this problem with short stories and with um, like chapters out of my novels where Amazon's like, hey, we found online that um, this work is published somewhere, so fix that or else we're going to take your book down. But the poetry, I don't know if it's just because it's so short, but a lot of the poems that are in End of Everything are online at places. Like that book has not been like, there hasn't been any strikes or anything. Now watch, now that I've said it, people are going to report it. And then I'm going to fucking have that. I think that's pretty much okay, but it is something to think about. So, and in case you don't know what the difference between KDP and KDP Select is, when you're putting your book up on Amazon, you do it through Kindle Direct Publishing, okay? And that's fine and everything's good. If you click to enroll your book into Select, what that does is it gives you the opportunity to use things like five days free every 90 days or countdown deals or putting your book in Kindle Unlimited so you get like page reads for your book for those people who have subscriptions to KU. So it's just a different thing. And if you are in select, the thing is Amazon's telling people that this is the only place you could find this book. This is why it's important for you to like join Kindle Unlimited and all this other shit. So then if your book, if parts of your book end up on other places, it makes Amazon a liar. And Amazon doesn't like to be a liar publicly, although you would think they don't fucking care, right? But, like, I don't think anyone will ever come at you for anything. Just know that when you give stuff out, and, like, J.H. had a really good comment here. And he said, whenever you write or make a creative work, you own it. And your rights to your own work don't disappear that easily. When you give your poems to a publisher, magazine, or website, what you're actually giving them is more or less a limited right to publish them. 
you're not giving anyone your actual work unless you have signed a contract that specifically says that you relinquish all your rights indefinitely. That's never something that happens by default. Websites won't be able to give you trouble for republishing poems somewhere else, and you don't have to credit them. And you don't have to, but it is nice to do so. Publishers can't claim that they own your poems, and they can't simply do whatever they want with your work outside of the scope of your agreement. It's always a good idea to be clear and specific when talking with publishers so that everyone knows what's going to happen, which in turn defines what cannot legally happen. Yeah, so that comment by JH is like perfect, so good on you there, dude. And then uh, Chill Baby also said, also, how different does a poem have to be legally to be considered a different poem? If I edit it and change the title, can I publish it as a different poem? Who are these people policing this shit anyways? <laughs> okay, okay. If you wanted to change your poem, you can totally do this. And um, I left a comment talking about somebody I know who um, writes poems and will send them out for submission. And if they get rejected, they will rework them and then write like version two or V2 next to it and send it out again. And they do this over and over and over again. Like, I've gotten poems from this dude that were like version 6, version 9. It's completely fine to do that like that. Now, are you worried about... Because this is a totally different thing to be worried about. That you submit your poem somewhere, it doesn't get accepted, and then when that book comes out, the editor or whoever you sent the poems to has their own poem in there that has like a line from your poem in it. This is something that actually happens... It doesn't happen a lot, but I. this is how I expect this happens. When you read poems over and over and over, like you're just reading through poems, reading through poems, reading through poems, sometimes you'll hit a poem that the poem isn't very good, but there's a line in it that it's like, oh, well, that's a fucking killer fucking line. Too bad the poem don't work, you know, whatever. And then you just keep going. And then like a week or two later, that editor is sitting down ready to write his own fucking masterpiece. And he starts writing. And then all of a sudden, like, something will click in his head. And he'll go, oh, dude, this, oh, here's a line. Completely forgetting that he read a line or a line like that in someone else's work. And this happens. But again, this is about inspiration. I don't think there's people out there like maliciously going, especially now with the internet and how quickly people could publish stuff and stuff. I don't think there's anyone going, oh, like, oh, this is a great line. I'm going to steal it and put it in my poem. But there will be times when things you have written will end up in other people's stuff or things that sound very similar to it. Good, like, th there's a lot of like poetry things like this where people will notice lines or words from their influences or whatever but there's also a lot of music stuff like this for instance if you like neil young or the rolling stones here's a good example so um the rolling stones had one of the most popular songs ever in the history of the world um satisfaction and it goes you guys have all heard it right well, a couple years later, Neil Young comes out with a song called Mr. Soul, and it goes, and it's just because like he heard that song and it sounded cool, but he wasn't really listening to music or whatever. And then when he w picked up his guitar, he like accidentally started playing it. He came up with it, figured it out, and was like, oh, dude, that sounds fucking awesome. And so now he has this song that sounds exactly like fucking Satisfaction. And then he did it again in the 90s with a Nirvana song. I can't remember what song it was. From a personal thing like that, I was in a band with this with a really good friend of mine. We'd been playing together for years, and then we were getting ready to go back in the studio and record another album. And I was showing him, and we were roommates at the time too. Or he was like staying at my place or whatever. And I was showing him the songs for the new album. And we never, like, sat down and, like, played them as a band or anything like that. But I think I, like, walked through it with him or whatever. And then, like, the band ended up breaking up. We never recorded the thing. Whatever. 
And then, like, nine months later, or like, a year later, like, we met up for lunch, and we were hanging out. And he's like, oh, yeah, dude, like, I got this great song. I really want to record it. And I'm like, oh, like, tell me all about it. And he's like, yeah, okay, it's called The Ballad of October. And I'm like, The Ballad of October? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, like, my song, The Ballad of October? And he's like, what? I'm like, that song I have, The Ballad of October. And, like, he's like, no, my no it goes like this and he started singing it at the table and then I'm like no dude like my song and it like <laughs> and the look on his face when he realized he was just like oh fuck I can't fucking believe he's like dude you have no idea like I've been thinking like this is like the this is the song this is the one that's gonna break dude this is it and he was like all pissed off I'm like dude play your song write your song like record your song it's fine there could be a million songs with the same title. I don't give a shit. Like, you don't give a shit. It's a good song. Just fucking do it. But these things happen, you know? So, and then, like, honestly, like, in the film biz, there are always people going, that motherfucker stole my idea and all this other shit. And if you read um, Rick Rubin's The Creative Act, like, that they can, like, there's some shit in there that's like, oh, that's how that happens. But that's, like, if you want to go ahead and read that. Okay, uh, JH said, I've been effed over a couple of times, strictly translation-related stuff, so that's why I come out of the woodwork to help you with your anxiety, which honestly is a very relatable. I've been working with publishers for years, and I still feel lost a lot of the time. I want things to be clear and fair. So thank you guys for those comments. That was some good shit, and hopefully that's helpful. Oh, this was on the State of um, Book Censorship in 2023 episode. David says, well said, Matt. You almost had me riled up to buy some of those top banned books, but then you suggested that being banned doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> and then I said, well, we should probably still support them, even though they're probably going to be just fine anyway. Oh, and then Brian said this. This is great. He says, my favorite school book banner activity is when parents bring their kid who checked out the book from the school library that the parents think should be banned for talking about sex and then have the kid read the dirty bits out loud in front of a room full of people, um, some of whom are kids. I mean it. These MFers are so worried that kids are getting warped by reading this stuff why have their kid read all the dirty bits over and over again to practice so they could read the dirty bits perfectly to the school board why potentially expose other kids to the dirty bits by reading them out loud just effing hypocrites oh that's fucking hysterical dude brian thank you for that oh my god that's some good shit this one i i didn't realize that this I mean, I'm glad it did, but the Sylvia Plath Effect episode, um, I've gotten a lot of awesome feedback about that. Uh, Chris says, read The Savage God if you want to understand suicide. The Bell Jar by Plath is a very funny account of her first suicide. Love that book. Julia. Hello, Julia. Says, I think poetry has saved people more than not. Depression needs an outlet. Poetry is a legitimate way to move through the stuff we go through. I have close family who committed suicide, and it really messes with you. I'd be interested to know if Plath and others had stopped writing poetry during the period leading up to their suicide. Also, comedians, I would think, could keep pace with poets. That's awesome. Yeah. Keep writing, talking to people, getting help, and don't romanticize suicide. It's brutal. Yeah, the comedian thing's very, very true. It's like the sad clown thing. I don't know if Plath stopped writing leading up to the suicide. I think... I know Plath would always write about the suicide afterwards. But I don't know if there was like a lull in the writing beforehand. That's really curious. And then Wicked Hole says, The best deterrent for suicide I may have, I may have ever heard of was from a friend who committed suicide last year. If you take your own life, you will piss and shit your pants, and everyone will point and laugh at you. That obviously wasn't strong enough deterrent for him, but it may be useful wisdom for others. That's heavy. That is true. You evacuate your bowels when you die. So if you want everyone to find a bunch of piss and shit, 
then there you go. And then this is from Shannon. I think all the arts attract the wounded, but especially writers, poets, songwriters, the most perhaps. I love that you're talking about this. I hate the stigma and men can't cry and people who commit suicide are weak. All of it angers me. I have per personally known four people who've committed suicide. None were poets, but one was a famous singer. Two were people I graduated high school with. I definitely use songwriting as an outlet for all my demons, depression, anxiety, OCD, etc. I will talk about this shit as much as people will listen. Have taken pretty much all the antidepressants and anxiety meds, lol. Have seen psychiatrists, therapists, out the yin yang, and yes, absolutely, mental illness leads us to write. I would say writing helped me more than any of the medications or therapists. People who haven't experienced it cannot understand it. Yes, like you said, it can take a long time to find something that works for you. It took me about 20 years to find the meds that actually made a difference. Whereas everything I took up to then made no difference whatsoever. I would take them for a long time and quit cold turkey and feel absolutely no difference at all. So yeah, 20 years. Probably more like 25 to be honest. No joke. And oh, Matt, yes, I have been in a facility for four days and there was young, there was a young, gorgeous girl who had slit her throat, big scar, and a guy who shot himself in the belly. You definitely see how bad it can be. Man, totally. Shannon, thank you so much for sharing all that. But yeah, stigma behind all this shit's dumb, dude. Like, dudes can cry. Like, it, it's not a big thing. It's okay to have like problems with depression problems with anxiety problems with mania problems with ocd like all of this is okay you know and like the only thing that i would say is weak about depression is not figuring out a way to fix it not that you're going to ever get fixed necessarily but just to deal with it and keeping it a secret I think that's like the most weak part of mental illness when people are afraid to talk about it. You know, it takes guts to say that you fucking, you know, have fucking problems. And Tim G, thank you for what you said there, man, too. There were a couple emails I wanted to get to. Let me see if I could get to them real quick. Now we're going to get into some kind of heavier um shit here this has to do again with the book banning episode this is an email from bruce so bruce thank you for writing in and this is the email i've been listening to you for quite a while now and want to say that i tend to love and agree with most of your views but i think that it isn't right for you to assume what would be good for the gay movement of the 1960s as a gay man, I don't even think I could say what would be best for them. You weren't there, you don't know, and you're not gay. Stay in your lane. So, that is very, um, right at you there. And that's fine. And Bruce, thank you for sending that. I appreciate you. And the thing that kind of cracks me up here a little bit is that as soon as I posted that episode, when I was editing the episode, I was like, you know what? I didn't really make myself as clear as I wanted to on this point. I'm like, I'm sure it'll be fine. I'm sure it'll be fine. I post the episode and I got this email like within the first day that the episode was up. So I pissed somebody off and I'm sorry for doing that. Um, let me explain my points. And I think my point was very clear um, for the most part where if you don't understand the history of something like you're doomed to repeat that history okay so in case you didn't listen to that episode and you don't really know what i'm talking about in the episode i was talking about the stonewall riots that happened in 1969 basically it was the there was a a series of riots that happened after a police raid of a gay bar. Horribly wrong, but at the same time, it was wrong for the raid to even fucking take place in the first place. And then after this happened, Ginsburg said that, um, how did he say it? Like, we will no longer be in the shadows or something of that nature. And he denounced 
the gay literature and gay art that came out prior to Stonewall because a lot of that was these scared, um, closeted... Um, he always used the F-A-G word when he was talking like this, which kind of cracks me up, you know, but whatever. So anyway, a lot of times, I mean, not now, I don't think anyone ever says it now, but like back in the 80s and stuff, like when people were talking about gay culture and gay art and stuff of that nature, um, especially coming from gay artists of any kind, they would always say, oh, well, you know, like pre-Stonewall, Da, 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 or post Stonewall, blah 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 blah. Okay, it was like the the end of a chapter. It was like the beginning of a new world. Okay, and if you haven't read the book Pulp Friction by shit, what's his name? Is it Mike Bronson or something like that? Pulp Friction. It's basically um, a book about pre-Stonewall gay literature and how most people don't even fucking know it exists and it's impossible to find for the most part. There are some websites out there that have collected a lot of it and made like PDFs for people to like read because like you really can't find these books anywhere. But pre-Stonewall, how gay literature had to be told was like this gay guy is obviously a degenerate and a horrible human being and he will die at the end of the book for being gay okay and the lesbian fiction was the exact same way and Anne Bannon who is probably one of the most famous of that era lesbian writer um, was really heartbroken when like the publishers were changing her endings to her books you know and I think since then, um, since the 80s, she went back and re-released the books with the endings that she wanted to have in the books. But that's a whole other thing. But like, just like William S. Burroughs had the obscenity trials for Naked Lunch, Howell got in a bunch of trouble with obscenity and all this other shit. Like, all of these things happened. My argument was, was if you cover up the ugly if you cover up all the ugliness of what happened before, people don't know about it. And the biggest thing of this for me is because I grew up in a very progressive area for the most part. I had a lot of gay friends growing up, and I saw my gay friends get hurt, get jumped, get beat up. I would see them in the hospital like on like life support from getting fucking jumped coming out of a gay bar and fucking the shit kicked out of them you know what I'm saying and a lot of the reason why this came up was because my kid and my kid's generation they have it very easy not now but like I would say 2016 2017 they didn't see the kind of the hard choices gay people had to make in order to be gay like whether it be like where you find people to hook up with where you like date where you meet um if you're afraid to hold hands in public for fear that someone's gonna fucking beat the shit out of you you know like all of these little things like my kids generation does not understand and now the fight my kids' generation has is, like, we can hold hands, we can do whatever we want in public, and that's fine. But now there's, like, laws trying to be made and all this other shit. It's like a different kind of oppression. I remember talking to a really good friend of mine about it, and he got really upset because he saw how, like, free and open my kid and all of her friends are like with their sexuality and everything and he was like there's a part of me that is so happy that they have it this good and that the only way they had it this good was all the shit we had to go through but it kind of like makes me mad that like 
they don't even understand that we went through that shit. They have like no fucking clue. And you could say like, yeah, it was really hard and people got beat up and they're like, oh, okay. Yeah, I guess like whatever, you know, but unless they fucking know, like they're not going to fucking know. And so this whole idea of like burying like bad stuff that's happened because it makes us feel uncomfortable is fucking bullshit. Like we need to know what fucking horrible things happen so we could look at our kids now and go, God damn, I'm so glad they don't have to fucking go through that. Now, again, the laws that have been passed over the last six months have made it really fucking difficult for me to fucking say that with a fucking straight face. But like, it is a different beast now. It's a different villain to fight. So I get that. But that's where I was coming from with what I said. And um, if that offended you, I fucking apologize up and down. But um, just know that what I said was coming from a good place and I meant no shit by it. So anyway, let me see. Um, I think I have another email that might be a little lighter. This came a while ago, so um, I'm really sorry it took so long to get to it. So this is from Ethan. And this is back about the um, politics and poetry episode. He says, I agree that it is good for art to be political to a certain extent. I believe all art ought to be humanistic. And in having humanistic concerns, the political is absolutely necessary. However, it's a shame because most of the political poetry I have read is only meant to stir up those who agree. Dude, I fucking agree with that statement. And um, I think I'm going to do a video on this other thing soon. And um, good God. Like, okay, whatever. That's a whole other thing. Also, most of the political poetry I've read is very pretentious and or quite dishonest. Political poetry can be done well, though. Just look at how many hip-hop artists make successfully political rap songs. I mean, political hip-hop is a major component of a rapper's poetic tradition. Public Enemy is one of the greatest American bands to ever exist. Tribe, De La Soul, newly on Spotify. And all of the way up to the present with groups like Run the Jewels, Kendrick Lamar, um, Lupe Fiasco, um, etc. Few poets reach those heights, though one of the only recent ones I have liked is the Chinese-American poet Wang Ping, see, my name is Immigrant from 2020. Interestingly, she was close with Allen Ginsberg in the 80s and up to his death. Oh, that's really interesting. I will check that out. Dude, Public Enemy was the fucking shit, dude. Goddamn. I'm probably a little older than Ethan. Um, I don't know if I am exactly, but um, Public Enemy was fucking huge. Um, Fear of a Black Planet, when that fucking came out, fuck, that was fucking big, dude. That was a fucking big deal, for real. And everyone likes Flava, Flav. Hell yeah. Okay. Talking about poetry in terms of changing norms like Ginsburg's Howl, that reminds me of the Irish filmmaker Neil Jordan, who has two movies that are very much about this. The stories of the movies themselves being about how people and experiences and their lives can give them more empathy for outsider communities. Those two films I'm thinking of being his explicitly LGBTQ ones, The Crying Game and Breakfast on Pluto, both wonderful must-sees. I've seen The Crying Game. I don't think I've seen Breakfast on Pluto. On AI with things like ChatGPT, I consider them more just a tool. Now maybe that tool has scary implications. With each new innovation in technology comes new dangers. Thoughtful humans have known this since the ancient days. Just consider the day Dallas myth or the Egyptian myth of Thamus and Thaouth. Jesus Christ, I feel like I'm reading a Star Wars book right now. We only have to think about how GPS has nearly abolished our ability to remember directions. Dude, oh my fucking God. Okay, I really don't use GPS very much. Like, I'll map something and just, like, look at the map and go, am I going, the, like, is that the, am I going to hit that freeway? Oh, okay, I'll figure it out. And that's pretty much all I do. But I have friends who, like, turn on the GPS and, like, listen to it and, like, turn in 500 feet in this whole thing. 
Now, I'm talking about people who've lived in L.A. for years. They have no idea what block they're on, what street they're on, what the next cross street's going to be. And it blows my fucking mind. And I'm like, well, like, and I'll say something like, oh, well, like, it's just like the next light after Taco Bell. And they're like, Taco Bell? And it's just like, they have no idea where anything is unless their fucking GPS tells them where it is. And that's terrifying. I've been in cars with friends where, like, they were driving and... I have friends driving me around a lot more now because, like, driving for me is, like, painful with my knee right now. And, like, we'll be going somewhere and they're like, like, are you going to put it into your phone? Like, the GPS? And I'm like, no. Like, just go. And like, well, what if, like, what if we don't know where to go? I'm like, like, we'll know where to go. Like, just take the 5 South and we'll either hit the 605 or the 710 and you could go down whichever one you want. Doesn't matter. And, like, saying it like that is like, what What are you fucking talking about? This is crazy. So, I kind of just went on a whole little thing right there. But, um, yeah. And, honestly, since I've done the AI episode, there's been some big advancement and news about shit going on with it that is making it even scarier. And, like, let's not even talk about the robot dogs. Like... If you know about the robot dogs, like, that's a whole other fucking thing we need to fucking worry about. And then he continues, "Um, I've used ChatGPT a bit. It's not scary to me yet. Just a learning AI built on a language model. I've done quite a bit of poetry work with it, too, and I have found it that it creates nothing impressive. You would think it would do well with formal poetry, but I have found it's nearly impossible to write formal poetry beyond ABAB rhyming quatrains. That makes sense. It does not do well with perfect rhyme, except for one or two syllable words in that Dr. Seuss sort of way, or consonant slant rhyme. But it does do assonant slant rhyme well. It's even worse at meter. It can kind of do iambic meter, but ask it for anything else, and it almost always fails. However, the kind of poetry I have found ChatGPT to be best at is the typical disjointed, non-sequitur, complex, free verse poetry common around contemporary academic poets and other prestigious literary types considered cool in those circles. The kind you will get tons of when you open pages of Poetry Magazine. Oh, it does a very good job writing the kind of poetry people like Ocean Vong write. (laughs) Not well, of course, but it does well within that genre. Oh my god, that's so awesome. I guess my question would be, the poetry that it writes like that, does it have feeling? Like, that's the most important thing to me. Like, you could write formal poetry, you can write free verse, you could do whatever. If it has feeling, that's what matters. And you could tell. When AI poetry starts having feeling, we're, we're all fucked. Like, that's when everyone has to, like, really be scared. And um, apparently, if you have made a name for yourself doing ABAB rhyming quatrains, people are quick to seek new gods to worship or hate. Also, narcissist is overused to death at this point. No, you are not a narcissist. Neither are a large number of, maybe even most of the artists people call narcissists. Dude, Ethan, thank you so much for that amazing email. Well thought out, well written. I appreciate you so much, man. All right, so this episode is long as fuck. With the butt plugs here, I will just say um, Bukowski Book Club. I'll have a link to the announcement video down below if you're interested in that. Um, Take a look at it. Um, This month we are reading The Days Run Away Like Wild Horses Over the Hills. Um, And I don't know if I'm going to keep it going, but it's Friday and I'll talk about it. 555. Cinco de Mayo for Cinco Dollars. 20 of my chat books are on sale at my Etsy shop right now for five bucks a pop. Okay. So there'll be a link down below for that too. run over there. Check it out. I want to thank everyone who sent in comments and who sent in emails. I appreciate you. If I missed your email and you're like, why haven't you read my email? If you could drop me another line, letting me know that you had an email that I didn't read, 
that would be awesome. It would be really easy for me to hit it up. Sometimes it gets kind of clouded with um, the emails that come in. So with all that said, everybody, thank you so much. I appreciate you all. Join the Anarchy Crew. Type hard. And I will talk to you all later. I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.